to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we'd like to remind everybody that the, all of these videos are posted on our BYU Family History Library website and also on our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel for review and, um, and learning. We'd also like to ask everyone to please help us out to improve our webinars. We've got a poll um, open here if you'd like to answer give us some feedback on what we can do to improve our webinars. All answers are confidential. Or if you'd like to email us, we'd love to have, um, we'd love to hear from you and so we can make these things a little bit better. Um, feel free to use the chat box for any questions during the webinar. If we're not able to answer them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Braden Knutson. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we'll be pleased to hear from James Tanner who will be giving a presentation titled don't you believe it? Debunking genealogical myths. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Hi, this is James Tanner, and we're here at the BYU Brigham Young University Family History Library in Provo, Utah. And we are presenting a, a series of webinars uh, reminding you, as uh, Braden in, did in the introduction, that these webinars are being recorded and posted to the BYU Family History uh, Library website and also to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. Uh, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel and you'll receive notice of any of the new videos as they are posted. Uh, our presentation today is called Don't You Believe It? It's Debunking Genealogical Myths. And uh, there's a little bit of confusion about the, the, this kind of topic that we're talking about. We have three different things. We have folklore and what we call urban legends and then myths. And uh, there are technical uh, definitions to each of these terms. Uh, most people tend to think that they're all about the same thing, but they, uh, they really aren't. And uh, we're gonna be focusing on uh, some of the myths of genealogy. Uh, I think some of them might pass over to be ur urban legends, and, uh, but they probably have not had enough time around to become folklore. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll look at that. And there's a diagram here on the screen that shows uh, what we have, uh, uh, truth, what truth is, and then what belief is. And the only part of, of, of that that uh, we can claim is what we have knowledge of. So we may have knowledge of our beliefs and we may have knowledge of our truth, of what is abstractly true, uh, but that doesn't mean we understand either all of our beliefs or all of, uh, all of what out there that is true. So we're going to be talking about uh, the area that's over on the blue side there, the belief side, as opposed to what's on the true side of this uh, little equation. Um, first of all, we'll, we'll def I'll try to define each of those areas. Uh, folklore is uh, traditional beliefs and customs and stories of a community passed through generations by word of mouth. Um, when I was a, uh, in graduate school at the University of Utah, one of the things that we did was to record uh, Shoshone Indian uh, folklore, uh, stories told by uh, older members of the Shoshone Indian tribe uh, about their uh, beliefs um, about the world, the way that they felt that the world was put together. Uh, these orally tra uh, transmitted beliefs are things that are kind of fundamental to our background of our society. And we, uh, we commonly think of those things like uh, the things that are associated with Christmas and, ha and Halloween, and not the religious portions of those beliefs, but the, 
uh, the, the practical things. Uh, uh, you know, it'd be hard, you'd be hard pressed to figure out what pumpkins have to do with, uh, with any of the ancient beliefs about Halloween, but we do have some very ingrained folklore about things like pumpkins at Halloween and holly berries, which do go back way back in folklore uh, in uh, Christmas. Um, the secondary urban legends do have a definition. And we had a very tragic circumstance here recently uh, of a young child that was uh, killed by an alligator in Florida. Um, urban legends uh, take, take their uh, beginnings, their, their genesis from this type of an event. And then they uh, build on that event and create a uh, usually a very disturbing uh, view of something. And one of the most common one that has been around for years and years is uh, alligators in the sewer. There's a uh, uh, urban legend in New York that uh, somehow pet alligators <clears throat> escaped into the New York City sewer system and have been surviving down in there. And of course, you know, people are afraid to go to the bathroom and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, there's an interesting sidelight to this. Uh, and the definition, the, the formal definition of an urban legend is a humorous or horrific story or piece of information calculated. Uh, it's circulated as if it were true. And it's usually uh, told that someone who knew or was there told the person who was telling the story. So they'll always say something like, well, I heard this from my brother-in-law and he was there when this happened. And that's the kind of thing that you'll hear. You'll always hear it, but it's always secondhand, but it is something that is passed on. Uh, sometimes they're pretty funny. Sometimes they're awfully gross. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, very, very terrible things that are happening. Okay. but. This was an interesting one, and, and the alligator story is uh, has some has some uh, real attachment to my background because I lived in in Mesa, Arizona, and this uh, Jack Adams alligator farm was actually in Mesa, Arizona. And uh, interestingly, if you go back in the news and the newspapers, you'll find out that this uh, alligator farm uh, went out of business and shut down uh, inconveniently not getting rid of any of the alligators that they owned and left them there on the premises, uh, which happened to be a, right next to one of the major canals in, in uh, Phoenix. Now, if you're not familiar with Phoenix, Arizona, uh, Phoenix is crisscrossed with a series of, of very big canals. They look like rivers, but they're mostly cemented, uh, uh, large, very, very, very large irrigation ditches kind of things. and. Uh, they're, they're like rivers, and uh, they have big fish in them, and uh, they could very well support an alligator or two. Well, there are, were reports and actual sightings and uh, alligators captured in the Phoenix area for, uh, for a number of years after uh, Jack Adams' uh, business went down in the bankruptcy. So uh, there now is still this legend, of course, that goes around Phoenix from per uh, periodically about uh, alligators in the in the canals, so uh, Phoenix doesn't have a big underground sewer system like New York, so they had to put the alligators someplace else, and now they're in the uh, uh, in the canal system. Uh, we were always kind of careful as kids not to go too near the canals, or not to. We were always afraid there might really be alligators in the canals. So. We have the third one, and the myth's definition is a widely held but false belief or idea. Okay, so the concept here of a myth is that the that the belief is false. Uh, alligators, urban legends, and folklore can can really be based on on something that actually happened or some true belief or incident or whatever. But myths uh, are really classified for their the fact that they're they're not true uh, there's no real true basis underneath the myths now that's marvel comics notwithstanding you know but anyway uh, they are uh, there is no basis for the, the myths in reality um, and interestingly enough gene genealogy has its myths there's uh, a whole bunch of them actually uh, from time to time over the past few years, I've uh, looked into some of the myths. And uh, 
there are some of them that have uh, the the uh, some of the aspects of urban legends because they they have a seed of truth seemingly back behind all of the of the trappings, but in reality they have no uh, no actual basis. So we're going to look at a bunch of these, and some of these you may have heard. It's very interesting because regardless of how many times we go through uh, this kind of an explanation that these kinds of things are not are not true and have no basis in fact, I will invariably in the next little while have someone walk up to me and start telling me one of these stories uh, as if it were actually true or part of their own uh, genealogy. And I, I have books. Uh, published material from my uh, uh, with my uh, published by some of my relatives in the past uh, that contain some of these myths I have incorporated some of them in their in their printed books so these things have a life of their own and they uh, they're almost impossible to uh, to debunk or to uh, prove that they're wrong first of all the, I, I would think one of the most prominent myths out there is that you can buy a family crest and that somehow or another every surname, uh, particularly English surnames, uh, had their origin and have a family crest and that they're entitled to this uh, heraldry, uh, based on heraldry crest. Uh, we're going to talk more about each of these, but uh, I just wanted to run through and kind of set the stage here. Uh, another myth that I hear regularly is Family, that the family name was changed when an immigrant came through Ellis Island, uh, usually saying that the government systematically changed the names of the immigrants, and that that is not that's also a myth. That's not true. We'll talk, as I mentioned, I'll go through these individually. All the records were destroyed in a courthouse fire, war, Chicago fire, earthquake, whatever it was. Uh, this is another uh, widely held myth, and one that I hear regularly from. Uh, the people that I help in the, as patrons in the in the BYU Family History Library and previously down in Mesa in the Mesa Family History Library. And then there's the standard, th there were three brothers who came to America. I have within the last month or so heard this one at least twice. Uh, I have had uh, people start out telling me about the three brothers who came to America. And uh, that that is a common a uh, commonly uh, held myth, uh, one that comes out almost all the time. Uh, this is another one, by the way, that I've heard within the last week, actually within the last two days, that my ancestor was a Cherokee princess. You can fill in whatever Indian tribe you want, uh, but generally uh, there's a uh, sort of generalized, passed down through the family relationship to uh, a Native American, uh, somebody of Native American royalty notwithstanding the fact that there were no Native American princesses as such in the United States, but we've uh, uh, certainly have preserved this, this particular myth in all its uh, variations. Uh, a few more continued. Uh, our family always spelled our name, and then they fill in how they always spelled their name, and the answer to that is absolutely not. Uh, names have changed considerably over time and uh, there was there are no such thing as standardized spellings until uh, even even most recently uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that more uh, my our ancestors came over on the Mayflower fought in the Revolutionary War were Civil War veterans or whatever now this is one that is very interesting because this could very well be true uh, my ancestors really did come over on the Mayflower uh, two of the families uh, married, and I am descendants from uh, from Francis Cook and Richard Warren, and and Richard Warren's son John, who were the um, excuse me John Cook, uh, who were the um, uh, Mayflower passengers. So that does happen, but uh, this is one of those that uh, is often disproved. Uh, Another one is our families related to Abraham Lincoln, whoever, take your pick. Uh, it's interesting here that many of these claims uh, claim relationship to, peop to uh, uh, famous people who had no children, uh, which is an interesting situation, but we'll, we'll worry about that. And uh, of course, there's the one about the ancestor was burned at the stake at the Salem witch trials. Um, so there's, uh, there's quite a few of these uh, kinds of, 
of myths that uh, are perpetuated. Uh, here's one that uh, perhaps you've heard and didn't realize was even a myth, and that is that genealogy is the second largest hobby in America. Uh, this has been repeated in print. It's been repeated by people who, uh, who should really know better, and it is just one of those things that uh, constantly gets repeated without any basis in fact whatsoever. Here's some more. Genealogy and family history are two different pursuits. Uh, that's a little bit complicated, but essentially, uh, as I'll discuss, these are really the, exactly the same thing. Uh, in fact, uh, if you went to England, uh, you would find out that, uh, that family history is the term that's used very commonly, uh, but that everyone acknowledges that genealogy and family history are the same. And yet you have people in the United States who, uh, who are just adamant that, that they're two different things. Uh, here's one, perhaps, that you uh, have adopted without even knowing it, and that is that genealogists are all retired old people. Uh, and then everything you need to find of your family history is online. This is a really new myth. This has come up in the, just the last few years. But there is a perception by a very large number of people that, that all the family history is now online and that they really don't have to go anyplace else to find their, their ancestors. Uh, this one is very pervasive. Um, I have run across this. I have learned not to say anything when someone tells me that they have traced their ancestry back to Adam. I no longer uh, am carefully explaining to them that it is entirely impossible to do that, but uh, uh, I just let them go ahead and believe whatever they wish to about that subject. And uh, this, is another, this is another really common one that's, that's been coming out lately. It's, it's kind of a newly, uh, newly minted myth. And it is that you don't need to be a genealogist to do family history. Uh, not only does this go back to the, to the myth about family history and genealogy of being two different pursuits, uh, but it is also the implication of what you're trying to say there is that you really don't have to know anything to do family history. And that uh, is another interesting subject. Oh, well, you thought I was going to run out of this list. Well, here we go some more. And with all the online trees, there's no need for desktop genealogy programs. Now, that's, uh, that's an interesting problem. Uh, it may be uh, uh, even questionable. Uh, this was said over and over again by genealogists for uh, the last uh, eight or ten years or more. Uh, but uh, uh, this may actually turn out to be true at some point in time. Uh, here's a myth that uh, you hear from time to time that genealogical research is easy. Uh, there's really nothing much easy about it. Uh, it may be easy to copy down what your mother tells you or your grandmother or your great-grandmother if you have that that uh, opportunity in your life. But on the other hand, getting into records and determining relationships can become one of the most challenging things that you'll possibly do. And then there's the one about a fortune. There might be a fortune waiting for me, this inheritance issue. Um, a lot of the genealogy that was done in the, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries was based on uh, stories that circulated that there were fortunes to be made from making claims in uh, estates in England and that all you had to do was, was trace your genealogy back to one of these fabulously wealthy people and then you would inherit all this money. Um, there was a whole business build up over that particular thing. And today we still have people who uh, are professional heir finders who uh, spend their lives looking for people for unclaimed money from estates. So. Um, this is another one that may or may not be a myth, but it's uh, certainly a, a pre prevalent when there's no expectation. One that's kind of obscure here and may not have ever even heard about this, but a lot of people uh, can, uh, there's a lot of websites online actually, and there's a lot of mail order things uh, that used to be uh, have uh, advertisements and national publications that said that uh, if you wanted to know about your surname and the origin of your family, all you had to do was send them five bucks or ten bucks or whatever it was. Well, this is a myth that you can that somehow people with the same surname are related. 
and one that's come up uh, fairly recently because people have these online family trees is that your genealogy is all done. Um, we'll talk about that. And unfortunately for everyone else, there are even more of these myths out there, and they are basically all the same category of rubbish. So we're we're uh, you know it would be impossible for me to even to even imagine what some of them are, because uh, some of these beliefs are so obscure. But um, on the other hand, there's lots of them we can talk about. Okay, so let's go through these in a little bit more detail. And, and get down to some, um, some reality here. Uh, the first one that I mentioned is you can buy a family crest and, and that requires you to understand a little bit about what's called heraldry and uh, how a crest is developed. Now, over the last couple of hundred years, there has been a cottage industry of people who are more than willing to uh, create for you a family crest or a family uh, heraldry uh, insignia. Uh, unfortunately, the whole concept of heraldry is that it's not for sale, it's inherited. Uh, and the fact that your name is uh, Tanner or Smith or McDonald or something does not mean you have any interest at all in uh, a uh, medieval uh, herald uh, uh, crest that was created as a result of an inherited right uh, to uh, to arms or uh, to uh, military activity in the Middle Ages. So uh, if you want to do your genealogy and go through the whole process, then you certainly can, you may find out that you do have some distant relationship to a family that had a crest but the fact that uh, somebody in your family paid somebody to draw up a crest for them a few years ago and put it in the front of a book about your family does not mean that that has any, uh, any other significance than being a crest. So what's the reality here? The reality is that if your ancestor had a coat of arms, the, the court of arms in the relevant jurisdiction will have records of the inheritance. So if you do your genealogical research, and you go into the uh, and able to trace your family back and you find out that you are related to someone who may have uh, potentially had a uh, coat of arms then um, that the records of that and your entitlement if there is any will be on record in the relative jurisdiction in the country where that coat of arms was created. That may be England, it may be Scotland, it may be Wales, it may be uh, Ireland, it may be any place, but uh, or some of the European countries. But that is a matter of, uh, of ancestral research and proof, not a matter of simply adopting uh, something that was associated with your particular surname. This one is uh, about your family's name being changed at Ellis Island is just simply not true. Um, it, uh, the government was not involved, the United States government was not involved in renaming any of the immigrants. Uh, the reality is that the immigrants changed their name before they came to the United States or after they came to the United States or on the ship coming over. Uh, but they did not, uh, that did not involve any official or even unofficial action on the part of the United States government at Ellis Island or any other location. Um, one of the families of my wife's families come from Sweden and uh, as a matter of fact they adopted surnames as did many of the other people in the uh, Scandinavian countries during the 1800s as a result of military service and for, any, and for a number of other reasons, uh, part of which was that they were using a system called patronymics where the children took the name of the father, uh, the, the uh, given name of the father as their surname. So Jens Jensen's son would be Peter Jensen and Peter Jensen's son would be John Peterson. So they would be, uh, so there were uh, the names would change in every generation and, and the governments in the 1800s began to outlaw this practice 
they didn't completely stamp it out. In fact, it's kind of resurging now in some of the Scandinavian countries. But uh, this had nothing at all to do with uh, Ellis Island or the United States. And so if your ancestor did change their name, it may have done it simply to Americanize their name uh, and make it sound more like they belonged here rather than um, for any other reason. So this is simply false. Your family was not changed, name was not changed at Ellis Island. Now, this is a serious one. This, this is a serious um, situation. Records were destroyed in courthouse fires and wars and the Chicago fire and the San Francisco earthquake and all sorts of other natural disasters that are out there. So we're not talking about something that didn't happen. Uh, but we are talking about the myth part of it. And the myth part of it is the first word up there, that all the records were destroyed. Um, I used to comment on this when I would uh, be talking about this and people would bring up this subject. And there is a whole category of genealogical research called burned counties research. And the burned counties are all listed. Uh, you can go to familysearch.org to the research wiki and get a list of every burned county in the United States. And they'll tell you exactly when the courthouse burned and what records were destroyed. And the question there is, um, were all the records destroyed? And the answer was no, because not all the records were ever kept in courthouses. The courthouses only had certain kinds of records. And the, when the courthouse burned down, uh, those records were perhaps destroyed. But then there's a follow-up on that, and that is that there are certain kinds of records which, even if they were destroyed, needed to be reconstructed. Those included land records, marriage records, inheritance records, probate file records, and things like that that affected property rights. Uh, simply, my, uh, my question when someone said, um, says to me, oh, well, I came from such and such a county in Georgia and all the records were burned in the courthouse and so we can't really find anything about our family. And I said, oh, you mean your family lived in that county for tax-free for the rest of their lives? They never paid any more taxes to the county or the state? And people would look at me and go, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, if all the records were destroyed, how did they know who to tax? And of course, then you start to think, well, yeah, uh, obviously, if, if the, the county wanted to keep functioning, they had to figure out who lived there and who owed taxes, and those records were reconstructed. So um, although the destruction of the records is real, the myth that all the records were destroyed is not real. Church records, school records, um, all sorts of records kept outside of the system. Uh, that of those things that were kept in the courthouse. They're tragedies, but they're not the end of the line as far as genealogical research is concerned. Some true, some false. Okay. There were three brothers who came to America. Interesting that there were also three wise men. Uh, that there were also, but by the way, let me let me make this challenge to you. Go back and read the, the, the Bible and figure out how many wise men there were. There is no number mentioned in the Bible. It says wise men came from the east. The three story is part of the myth that uh, has been added to the, to, the, uh, to the story. And I don't know why it was three brothers, but that seems to be the common uh, myth. And the myth goes something like this. There were three brothers who came to America and one went north. And one settled in where he landed and the other one went west. And we've never been able to locate the one who went west. Okay, so those are the, there's always that. And it's, and it's amazing how many times you hear that exact same story. Now, the problem is with this particular myth is that there really were three brothers who came to America. There were probably five brothers. There were probably two. There were probably seven. There may have been as many as 10 or 15 brothers who came to America. But the number three associated with this myth implies that there was one of them at least who was who has been absolutely unable to be found no matter what records or whatever is is uh, is discovered so um, this is really more uh, when you get into these kinds of myths they're really more excuses for not doing research than they are actual uh, issues or problems that that occur because of the of the myth of 
the uh, situation that was uh, the reality situation. So some true, some false. This one is, yeah, there are families where there were three brothers, and yeah, they did come to America. But uh, generally speaking, the, this story is uh, the loss of one of those uh, who can never be found again, who vanishes into the West or whatever. Okay. Um, this all was an interesting one. That, uh, and, and in all the years that I've been listening to this, people start out and tell me this story uh, as if it were just absolute truth is that there it's always Cherokees um, you know there's hundreds of Indian tribes in America uh, and of those uh, all those different uh, tribes it's the Cherokee princess that is the one that always gets it now let's go back to the story uh, that kind of started this whole thing and that to be quite frank was uh, an Indian by the name of Pocahontas uh, and, and let me go aside, uh, sort of a side action here. Um, I could refer to these people as Native Americans uh, or the first people or whatever, and those are all politically correct ways of, of addressing them. Uh, but uh, uh, these, the myths here are associated with the idea of an, of an Indian tribe. Um, and so we're so that's the term I'm using in this particular context, and I'm not not to trying to be offensive to anyone, but uh, um, we're still uh, in the in the throes of of trying to uh, to change those titles. Now, the question is, do people have Native American blood? The answer to this is really simple: go get a DNA. This is almost always false. I have. Only a, ha a small handful, I think, of all of the cases where people have come in and said that uh, they were related to uh, Native Americans, uh, have we been able to trace it back and prove that. Other than that, most of, the, most of those have been disproved. Now, today, we have a very interesting way we can do that. We can go get a DNA test. Uh, you can go to any one of the larger uh, genealogical websites. Um, Ancestry, my heritage, uh, uh, all those people have uh, associations with various DNA companies, and uh, or go contact one of the your own DNA company and have them do a study, and they can tell you with uh, with a fairly high degree of uh, of probability whether or not you have any Native American uh, genes. So. Uh, I would suggest before you go buying into this and spend a lot of time either proving or disproving this this uh, particular claim that you get a DNA test. Now, there's another aspect of this that needs to be brought out, and that is that many people are interested in proving a claim uh, to uh, a, as a relationship to a particular tribe, and the reason is because they see the tribes as doling out money to uh, their uh, tribal members. Um, uh, as far as I have been able to determine, uh, I am unaware presently of any tribes in the United States who are still allowing people to openly um, apply and become members of the tribe. Uh, whether or not you can prove you are related to the Indians and descendants is not, uh, does not seem to be an issue anymore. It's more of a fact that they're mostly closed. There may be still some open, and you're you're perfectly willing to you know to do some research and find that out. Um, we were uh, we were instructed uh, as volunteers at the Mesa Family Search Library not to assist people in this process because of the uh, problems and implications and issues that were involved with that. So this is kind of a uh, this is one that has. Uh, uh, some basis in fact people do you know everyone does have uh, there are lots of people who have children and so uh, there are uh, lots of people who could be related um, and that could be true but this is something that needs to be proven through either a, a dna test or looked at from the standpoint of uh, verified genealogical research so here's my example here's my suggestion here get a dna test This one is interesting because I've actually almost come to blows with people over this particular myth. 
Um, the one that I get frequently is that my family spells the name S-E-N, and we are from Denmark. And those people who spell their name S-O-N are from Sweden, and we're not related to the Johnsons from the J-O-H-N-S-O-Ns. We're the S-E-N family. And my answer is, well, my great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was named O.V. Christian Ovison, and his last name was spelled O-V-E-S-E-N, which he changed to O-V-E-S-O-N while he was still in Denmark. And when he came to America, he heard everyone heard him say Overson and put in an R, and so he changed his name to Overson, O-V-E-R-S-O-N. And then his son changed his name to Ovison because he didn't like Overson. He thought it was giving up his um tradition in his family. So he changed his name back to O-V-E-S-E-N. And his children got upset with him because they were still related to all their cousins. And so they changed their name to O-V-E-R-S-O-N. And so as the family goes, if you've got Ovisons, Ovisons with an E, Ovisons with an O, Oversons with an O, uh, all of them can be related to me because they've all changed their names back and forth. Uh, over the last hundred years, depending on what they felt about their family tradition. So the fact that your family spelled their name any particular way is uh, a truly a myth. It is really false. Just simply didn't happen that way. Okay, now this one is another one of those. Our ancestor came over on the Mayflower, fought in the Revolutionary War, whatever. Uh, one of the ways that this always comes up is so I have people coming in and, and they, they say, now, I need some help. Uh, I have uh, my application to this uh, Heritage Society, and whether it's the DAR or the Mayflower Society or whatever. And then they're always saying to me, I, can, I have it complete except this one person who just does not, I cannot find the connection between this person and the person who is the key person to prove that I am descendant from the Mayflower or the Revolutionary War or whatever, whatever. Um, in those few cases when we have sat down and carefully gone through uh, the, the uh, proof, in quotes, uh, of what they've tried to show uh, their relationship, uh, it generally uh, get to the point where we say, no, I'm sorry, we don't, we, uh, we don't believe that you are, and we don't believe that this person was this person's son or daughter or whatever. And uh, they're basically not, ex not going to accept that from us. And uh, they go off and try to find somebody else who agrees with them. Um, so uh, this is a very, a very interesting um, aspect of the whole process of doing genealogical research. Um, if you begin your genealogical research with a predetermined goal of proving that you are related to a particular person, then uh, you're almost always going to be um, upset or uh, disappointed with uh, the results of the research. So the answer here is do your research. Uh, and if the research shows you are related to uh, a Mayflower family, then wonderful. If not, uh, then uh, that's too bad. But uh, the research is the research, and whatever it shows is whatever it shows. Now, this is exactly the same situation as being related to any particular famous person. Um, there are programs, and there are ways of showing how people are related. Um, generally, they refer to those as uh, a fifth cousin, for example, three generations removed, or a tenth cousin, four generations removed. Well, where this goes back to, it goes back to a principle called pedigree collapse. And what pedigree collapse is, is it's a, a shorthand way of referring to the fact that as we go back in time, that people have a tendency to marry their cousins, um, especially if they come from a, a, all come from a small concentrated geographic area, very, very likely that, that uh, back in the past, some distance back, that, their co that people got relate, married to people who were, they were related. My parents were supposed to have been second cousins. There is some doubt about that because the person they were related to 
uh, through through the uh, lineage may not in fact be a member of the family at all but could have been adopted uh, so they may not be related at all but uh, as we have done more and more research in our family uh, my wife and I for example uh, discovered that we are sixth cousins and I also found out that I'm uh, like a third cousin one two generations removed from my son-in-law from one of my son-in-laws so you know uh, sons-in-law so this is an interesting situation because it's really a matter of research the fact that your last name is Lincoln does not mean that you are related to Abraham Lincoln um, in my family the persistent myth was that we were related to Daniel Boone because Daniel Boone's mother was a Morgan and we had a Morgan family line. Well, that took me all of about 15 minutes to disprove uh, when I was doing research and, and ran across that family myth. So the answer again here is the same, and that is do your research. Um, same here. Uh, this is just another a variation on the same theme of being related to uh, a... Uh, uh, her, uh, society like the Mayflower Society or the uh, Daughters of American Revolution or whatever. Uh, although it, I don't know that there's quite as much uh, prestige uh, out there uh, of being related to someone who was burned at the stake in Salem, Massachusetts, as there is to somebody who came across on the Mayflower or who uh, uh, was uh, in the Revolutionary War. Uh, but there is some notoriety here and people... Uh, seem to make this claim quite frequently. Um, interestingly, uh, some of them aren't even related to anyone in New England, so it's pretty hard to figure out how they got that belief. So this is another do your research uh, subject where you need to go out and, and actually prove your relationship if that is the case. Uh, this one is, is has been in print so many times that it really has kind of taken on its own uh, validity. Uh, I have on occasion when I've seen it uh, in things like the New York Times or, or quoted in one of the, in one of the um, prominent online magazines uh, or by someone who uh, mentions it in the course of a talk or discourse on family history or genealogy. Um, they say something like, oh, well, of course, everyone knows that genealogy is the second largest hobby in America, and blah, 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 and on and on and on. The answer to this is absolutely not. Simply false. This is just absolutely unsupportable. There is no, no statistic. There's not any statistic, any study, any survey, anything that you can do that will prove that doing genealogy is anything like a hobby, uh, like a popular hobby in America. The question could be asked like this, are you interested in your family? Are you interested in your family history? Yeah, well, the answer to that is yeah. And I could say, uh, you know, are you interested in, in, uh, uh, in heart surgery? And the answer is yeah, especially if I have a bad heart. Uh, are you interested in becoming a heart surgeon? Probably not. Well, the answer is, if you're interested in your family, are you interested in going in and, be, and doing research and sitting at a micro, in front of a microfilm reader all day long? Uh, probably not too many people who would answer that question in the positive. Um, so where does this come from? I have no idea. I have traced it back as far as I can. I have never found a list of hobbies in America that had genealogy anywhere listed on it. Uh, if you look at any kind of statistics having to do with uh, for instance, websites and popularity of websites. Uh, there are a couple of genealogical websites that have a lot of use, uh, but as far as the numbers of sites that are concerned and the numbers of people who are there, all you have to do is look and see how many people watch the NBA or watch the National Football League or go to a, oh, go to a, uh, a, a can attend a, a conference. Uh, there's one example, and this is kind of a, a, a cheap shot kind of an example, but uh, the largest, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, genealogical conference in the United States is held in Salt Lake City and uh, had about 20,000 people attend. In the same year, they had one of many what are called ComCon, uh, Comic Con or ComCon conferences where you have all these uh, comic characters or 
or uh, superhero characters, uh, people act out and dress up like it. The conference in Salt Lake that was the same year as the uh, 20,000 attended uh, genealogy conference had 80,000 attendees in Salt Lake City. Um, it's very hard for me to, to see where this one comes from. This one is just two different words. There's genealogy and there's family history, and they're really absolutely the same thing. And they both have the same goal. Uh, there are lots of people that want to uh, sanitize the term genealogy because, of course, genealogy is for old people and genealogy is uh, unattractive because it's uh, sitting around uh, gathering names and dates and places and and all this. And whereas family history is the expansive part of it, it's the stories, it's the photographs, it's the interesting part. Well, genealogy is the stories and the photographs and the interesting part. Um, it's just uh, it's just a, a, a Ban, you know, just kind of trying to uh, create a different, uh, put a different spin on uh, on the subject and make it more uh, popularized. And family history to some people is a more acceptable term than genealogy, and so they they try to differentiate the two. Uh, really, they both have exactly the same definition, and they both involve exactly the same processes. And if you're interested in in names and dates and you're doing family history, then that's fine. And if you're interested in stories and photographs and doing genealogy, then that's fine. So this is just simply false. They're the same thing. Um, genealogists are all retired old people. This is entirely true. Uh, we have to get down to facts, folks. We're all old fogies. We're all doing this in our old age. And uh, no, this is not. This is only partially true. It's, sometimes it's false. But um, there is a, a direct correlation between awareness and, and the, the, the need to pass on traditions and family stories and to uh, become a finally obtain an identity with, that comes with, with age and maturity. Um, even though there are always exceptions, there are young people who become extremely involved, most of us who have been doing genealogy for a lot of years were young at the time we started. Uh, but uh, if you go to any of the conferences out there, uh, attend the larger conferences, you're going to see a, a very, very heavy preponderance of uh, older people and who are retired people in this particular area. So I just kind of making a little bit of a barb there. Um, Everything you need to find your family history is online. That would be wonderful if it were true, but it uh, depends on what you need. Um, if you're looking to find your ancestors back uh, 100 years or 150 years, it's very likely that, that the information about your family is online someplace. If you go back 200 years or more, uh, the chances are uh, that the information has yet to be put online, if it ever will be. Um, there is plenty of information out there sitting in, in courthouses and, and archives and libraries on paper that has yet to be digitized and is not online. So that one's just a, sort of, a, of where you're coming from. Uh, you may find everything you need online, but uh, if you keep uh, looking back in time and you keep doing research, you'll eventually find run out of of online resources. I've uh, done a video on this that's a very popular video on tracing your, my ancestry back to Adam. Um, it does happen uh, that, uh, that there are many, many pedigrees out there showing how uh, Adam and, and to, uh, to say that you somehow or another don't believe this is tantamount to claiming that you don't believe the Bible, so it's pretty hard to uh, to argue this one. Uh, the connection is not the Bible problem. The Bible is not the issue here. What's the issue is everything between the Bible and the last discoverable records in Western civilization, uh, which uh, go back uh, only reliably back to about 900 AD. Um, and for the most practical purposes, the records from, for nearly everyone uh, who isn't uh, provably direct, uh, directly descended from royalty uh, is 
usually ends in the mid 1500s, the early 1500s. And my answer here again is do a DNA test. You may find out that you have a significant uh, percentage of Neanderthal blood and then you might have some uh, more things that are difficult to explain in your background. I'm not kidding about this one, folks. There are the standardized testing now that they're doing will give you uh, to many people are coming back with a percentage of the Neanderthal blood that they have. Um, this one's kind of pernicious. Uh, you don't need to be a genealogist to do family history. Uh, the problem here with this is if they're the, both the same thing, then what do you mean you don't need to be a family historian to do, to do genealogy or you don't have to be a genealogist to do family history? This is one of those statements that um, uh, sounds really good until you start talking about it and then you realize that it's just kind of silly. It doesn't have to, it doesn't really have anything to do with uh, with the reality of what you do as either a family historian or a genealogist. Uh, what they're trying to say here I believe is that uh, there are uh, a lot of online helps today that will assist you in uh, compiling a family tree uh, that we didn't have a few years ago and uh, that by relying on these things uh, that you don't have to become as deeply involved in doing research as you did a few years ago that you can actually compile a family tree. Now, like I said, this may be true for about the first 100 years of, Jenny, of research, but uh, going back, uh, by the time you get to the early 1800s, you are definitely into doing uh, some uh, pretty, pretty uh, severe um, and very, very detailed research. Uh, also, the numbers here uh, argue against this statement because, uh, the, first of all, uh, you start out with two parents, four grandparents, and as shown in this little uh, picture online here, every generation the number of your ancestors doubles, at least, and could go even more than that if you include uh, multiple marriages and relationships through death and remarrying and all that. But uh, even if you uh, look at it just on a pure geometric uh, progression, you'll see that they have, uh, that you can have over a thousand uh, uh, direct line ancestors uh, just going back a couple of few generations. And uh, then the number jumps to 2,000 and then to 4,000 and then to 8,000 and so forth. Although that's not practically real. Uh, because of what I caught, mentioned earlier called pedigree collapse where people have married their cousins. Uh, that really does never happen. Uh, the number is never gets that great or you'd be related to more people than have ever lived on the face of the earth. So uh, the answer is that um, uh, the numbers though are so great that this, uh, this is really kind of silly. Um, And regardless of whether you think that family history and, and genealogy are the same, you are one if you're looking for your, your ancestors. So you're either a genealogist or family historian, take your pick. Um, no need for a desktop genealogy program. This one is really complicated. Now this is changing. There are some very sophisticated online family tree programs that serve uh, adequately or even more than adequately as a place to store all of your genealogical information. Uh, this uh, has been an, an ongoing discussion and I'm going to say it depends and it really depends on how you view your um, uh, place and what you're doing uh, in your in your uh, genealogy. Some people wish to have their own uh, private uh, database that they work on and others uh, are perfectly happy to put all of their information into an online family tree. I think I've said enough about this uh, to make uh, to answer this question. Uh, you wish that genealogical research was easy. It's not. Uh, it is a very challenging and a very difficult uh, uh, pr uh, pursuit. Um, I, my comment in response to this, uh, people who say how easy genealogy is, is if it were easy, I wouldn't be a bit interested in it. I'm only attracted to it because it's one of the most challenging and difficult subjects that I've ever run across. 
Um, if this is your motivation, go after it, folks. Do the research. My answer here again is you wish there's a fortune waiting for me. Um, uh, if you really think there's a fortune out there in genealogical research, uh, try, uh, try getting a job that pays enough money to keep you alive doing genealogy. Uh, there are quite a few professional genealogists out there, but uh, uh, I would hardly think that any of them are getting a lot of money for their for their efforts. Um, of course, there's people who work for large genealogy companies, and I'm sure they're paid as uh, commensurate to their their experience and their um, contribution to the countries they work, the companies they work for. This has nothing to do with that. This has to do with people who think that there's an inheritance. I happen to know enough about my genealogy to have had this put to bed a long time ago. My ancestors were, uh, there were some that were uh, more wealthy than some, uh, but none of that inherited money is ever going to come down through to me, except perhaps from uh, uh, my own immediate family. Um, this one, the learning about your surname from mail order sources, um, uh, this is a pretty casual, uh, superficial look at genealogy. Uh, people who assume that because you have the same surname, I, I you know, with a name like Tanner, Tanner is a very uh, not as common as some names, but more common than others. Uh, now being adopted as a as a, a given name, uh, many people that have that as their first name now. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is that there's always people out there that assume because your name is Tanner that you're somehow related. And uh, the Tanner name uh, is one that uh, was very obviously adopted from uh, a profession or, uh, or, pers or pursuit uh, by, the, by the ancestors and it arose in many, many different locations uh, and was applied to many people who were, who were not at all related. So if you want to know if you're really related and you through a surname, get out there and do a DNA test and put your DNA results up on a big family tree and you'll get lots of people. You'll have more relatives than you want. Uh, this one is kind of a trap that your genealogy is all done. Um, uh, if someone in your family did a lot of genealogy, the answer uh, research about your family the answer is they probably have more questions unanswered than they have answered. Um, not only do the number of your ancestors increase in every generation, the number of unresolved questions increases in every generation. And so there's never an end to what you can do to find out more about your family. This is another you wish that it was all done. Uh, and we can all dream. We can all wonder and wish that some of this stuff was actually true and that uh, there was uh, some shortcut way of getting all your uh, ancestors put together and all this information gathered sort of magically while we all went to sleep. And uh, uh, thanks for watching this. We've uh, talked about quite a bunch of uh, different uh, rather difficult subjects. Uh, remind everyone that these uh, presentations are posted online on the uh, BYU Family History Library YouTube channel and on the BYU Family History uh, Library website, which is part of BYU.edu, uh, a big university here in Provo, Utah, Brigham Young University. Thanks for watching. Thanks, James, for the great presentation. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments here. I asked the question Have you come across any myths in your genealogy research? And um, we had some pretty interesting answers. Um, Barbara said that um, that her family was supposedly related to Bedrick Smetana. Sorry if I pronounced Smetna. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, um, oh well, somebody in the in the comments says they're doing research that says they're related to Daniel Boone. Well, this is an interesting fact. The, the the problem here, what we're talking about, is that yeah, these people had children, they have descendants, and they have relatives. Um, so it's very possible that you're related to Daniel Boone. Um, he lived a long time, by the way. He was uh, he traveled across the country and he had quite a few kids. Um, the question, though, is that. Um, 
uh, is that what kind of relationship? Do you share a common ancestor? Um, that's a whole interesting issue because uh, as you go back in time, uh, we all share a common ancestor. In fact, uh, most of what the DNA has been proving uh, over the last few years, uh, if anything, uh, has, it is that, uh, that we are all commonly related in some way. Uh, and that if you go back far enough in our uh, in our communal history, that we are all part of one huge human family, uh, and uh, that's except for those Neanderthal guys out there that uh, we haven't quite added into the human family yet. Um, if you think that's a joke, don't. It's not. <laughs> it is absolutely what's going on. They are actually finding G uh, Neanderthal genes mixed in among the homo sapiens. Okay, well, that's, any other questions in there? Oh. Thanks. Thanks. We'll see you next time.